Once when my little sister was in kindergarten, she actually ran into a wall. She was kind of like walking backwards, talking to one of her friends, and she spun around and she hit her forehead right on the corner of this really big brick wall. And her head split open a little bit and she had to get seven stitches. But for the next few years of her life, she ended up looking a little bit like Harry Potter. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a give and the take there. But the, mo the important thing to remember is that walls can be fairly harmful then. Now, I'm not saying that all walls are inherently bad. I mean, this chapel has walls, and that's a very good thing. I mean, it keeps out the rain and the wind and the small woodland creatures and the bugs. But walls can also be harmful. For example, this wall that we see in Ephesians 2, this wall of hostility, as you may have guessed from the way that Paul names it, the wall of hostility, is not necessarily a good thing. It actually talks about this wall in the Temple of Jerusalem. And what this wall did is it was a fairly short wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of the Jews. And so Basically, this wall said that the Jews were better than the Gentiles, the Jews were somehow closer to God than the Gentiles, and basically all around better. And that then represented hostility in the situation. In fact, a Gentile could not enter the court of the Jews without defiling it and therefore risking execution. So it's pretty easy then to look at that and be like, hey, that's not a good thing. And if you read the rest of the passage, you can tell that Jesus also thought it was not a good thing and therefore came to destroy the wall and all that it stood for. But it's still hard not to ask the question then, where do we still build walls in the church today? And I'm not just talking about structural walls because obviously all churches have walls but social walls, walls that communicate this similar hostility. And obviously these walls are a bit harder to see, but they can be even more impactful than literal brick walls. So I've come up with a few different reasons why we build these social walls, and they're kind of similar to the reasons that we build real walls. And we can build walls when we want to keep something out, when we want to keep something in, and when we want to separate things. So let's start with keeping something out. Now, I believe a great example of this is the Great Wall of China that the ancient Chinese built in order to keep out the northern nomadic uh, tribes and armies from invading. So um, if you have a picture, uh, this is, according to the movie Mulan, what these Huns looked like. And if you examine him, his hand looks roughly the size of my entire head. His shoulders are probably as wide as my body is tall. And he has these eyes that are sort of piercing into your soul. And probably since they're yellow, indicates some sort of disease that he also has. But I don't think that that's exactly what they were going for when they made him have yellow eyes. I think they were going for menacing. And yes, this is an artist's depiction of this people group, and it's not necessarily accurate, but I do think Disney got across the point that the Huns were a very threatening people to the Chinese. So naturally, the Chinese built a wall to keep them out of their country and protect their people. And you see, when we feel threatened by people, we can do a similar sort of thing. And we can be threatened by people for all sorts of different ways, not just because they're more physically imposing than we are, but maybe they're better at something than we are. And we don't really want to hang around them because we feel threatened by the fact that they could be better than us. For example, there was this girl in my high school who was very good at acting. She always got the lead roles in plays and musicals, and because of that, people kind of tended to stay away from her. They were jealous of her, and I was one of those people. I figured she was probably pretty full of herself anyway, and probably not a particularly nice person to know, so I just avoided her. But in my senior year, I actually had a few classes with her, and it turns out she was one of the nicest people that I had ever met. And we ended up working at a coffee shop together, and we became friends. But you see, that wouldn't have happened if I had continued to just shut her out of my life. Now you see, we can feel threatened by people because they're more popular than us, they're better at our favorite sport, or we just don't tend to like the fact that they have more friends than we do or something. 
And it might not seem like too bad of a thing at a time that we say, hey, I don't really want to talk to you. I don't really want to be your friend. I just don't really want you in my life. And since there's no immediate consequence to that, we don't feel as if we've done anything wrong. But the thing is that God didn't design his kingdom to be a place where we go like this in relationships. We're meant to mesh and to live in harmony with each other and live in community. And that requires not building those sorts of barriers. Well, the second reason that we can build walls is because we want to keep something in. Like how many of you, let's just take a quick poll. How many of you have a dog? Not here at Trinity, but back at home. Okay, like a good amount of people. Now, how many of you just decide to let your dog roam around the neighborhood wherever he likes? Oh, a few people, but considerably less. You see, when we want to protect something, like our pets, we decide to keep them behind a fence or inside the house to keep them safe. I have a little dog. His name is Chewbacca, but we call him Chewy for short. This is him. He is a Yorkshire Terrier, and he is, yes, one of the most adorable creatures you have ever seen. And when we send him outside, we always hook him up on a leash. So he runs out, does his business, and comes back in and doesn't run away. It works pretty nifty. Well, my dog also tends to like to go to get the mail with my mom. Why he's so enthralled with our mailbox, I'm not sure, but he loves going outside to get the mail. Well, one time my mom took him outside and he decided that he would run across the street and into this nearby field. So my mom yelled at him, told him to come back, but he's a very stubborn little dog, so he wasn't coming right away. And so she started to walk over to get him and he realized, oh, I'm in trouble now, I should probably come back. And so he exited this little patch of weeds and walked onto my neighbor's driveway and sort of just like fell down in this little sad furry heap. And you see what had happened when he had gone frolicking about in the wilderness was that he had stumbled upon this patch of little sticker things. And so he had those little Barbie stickers on his paws and on his legs, and it was just really, really sad. You see, we try to keep our dogs inside because we don't want them going out and getting hurt. And see, we do the same thing in relationships when we're afraid of getting hurt. We try to keep ourselves behind a fence or a wall, too. So these two psychologists named Erwin Altman and Dalmas Taylor actually have a concept that describes this, and it's called social penetration theory. And it basically says that people are like onions. <laughs> or like ogres, because ogres are like onions too, but we'll just cut out the middleman and say people are like onions. <laughs> and so what we have then is we have a layer of our social self. And this is uh, information about ourselves that we're willing to share with pretty much anyone. Like, oh, my name is Bob, I play basketball, I'm studying business, I like the bears, I basically like anything that starts with the letter B. <laughs> and so we can share this sort of information without too much repercussions, unless, of course, we're talking to a Packers fan. But a few layers down from that, we have semi-private information. And this is information that we're really not willing to just go out there and share with everyone necessarily. Maybe it's a certain religious belief that we have or a certain political belief or an awkward family situation that we have. And so only a few people really get to know those sorts of things about ourselves. And then a few more layers down, we have our layer of a private self. And this is information that we rarely share with anybody. Maybe it's a really tough memory from your past or a sin that you struggle with, or maybe it's just one of your biggest hopes and dreams. But you see, when we feel like someone might judge us for showing some of those inner layers of ourselves, we tend to only share this outer layer of information. And to a certain extent, that can be really healthy. I mean, it's probably not a good idea to go running down the streets yelling your social security number. But to a certain extent, we also need to be willing to allow people into the sort of deeper parts of our lives, even if that means that there's a risk and that might be kind of scary. You see, the kingdom of God is meant to be a place where we can have deeper relationships, where we can mesh and have deep conversations in the dorm late at night. And 
to do that, we have to be willing to take that little bit of a risk. And that goes both ways then. If somebody has decided to tell you something a little bit more personal about themselves, you need to take that with uh, seriousness and really listen to them and show them that they're cared for. Otherwise, you can end up building a wall there. You can start saying that, of course, inferred that I don't really care about you and that's why I'm not listening. And that will make them not want to share as much with you. And before you know it, you have this example of a wall of hostility. Now, the final reason that uh, we tend to build walls is that we want to separate things. And this is just sort of a natural thing we do. We organize things. I mean, in your dresser, you have your drawer for your socks and your drawer for your pants and your drawer for your shirts because if you had your pants and your shirts and your underwear all strewn about your drawers, that would just be utter chaos. I mean, I'm not here to judge you if that's what you do with your dresser. But for most of us, we do tend to separate things. But as I'm sure you're all aware, it's not a good thing to separate people. Now, there are tons of social implications and social issues tied up in this, and I'm not going to get into those right now. So uh, for right now, I'll talk about Mean Girls. Now, for those of you who have not seen this brilliant piece of cinema, it... It follows the main character, Katie, who has spent most of her life living in Africa. And so when she comes back to America and has to attend North Shore High School, which as a matter of fact isn't too far from here, she has to adjust to this whole new social world. And so she makes two friends and they decide to help her out by drawing a little map up for her that shows where different classes are and stuff, but then it also includes this entire diagram of the cafeteria. You see, each person that goes to North Shore High School fits into some sort of clique, and then what group they're a part of actually dictates their geographical spot in this cafeteria. And so we literally have these spaces between groups, and those groups are not allowed to mesh. They are very strict and very strongly upheld in the school. Now, through the course of the movie and various events, uh, those cliques get broken down because if you didn't know before the movie, cliques are a bad thing. And eventually everybody sort of starts to live in harmony and not just be with their own little social group. As the main character says in the movie, girl world was finally at peace. But you see that peace couldn't be achieved when you had all of these social spheres and social walls hanging around. You see, we can't have peace when we have walls, whether we're building those walls to keep someone out, to keep something in, or to separate people. And we all do those things far more often than we realize or we would like to admit. Like, we sit in chapel and we hear someone's testimony and we think to ourselves, wow, they have such a better testimony than I do. Tim Hawkins actually has a joke about this, and yes, I'm telling a Tim Hawkins joke in chapel, so... Yeah, oh good, we have a fan. <laughs> anyway, and so Tim Hawkins says, what happens we, is we get testimony jealousy, and we're sitting in church, and we're thinking, man, that guy has a great testimony. My testimony stinks. I wish I were addicted to crack. <laughs> and so maybe we don't necessarily think those thoughts specifically. I hope we don't. But we tend to make these social comparisons when we hear other people speak. And if we don't do that, maybe we think, wow, they don't seem like they have as firm of a relationship with God as I do. Now, maybe we don't think those words specifically either. But one way or another, our first, in, our first impulse when we hear someone else is to say we are either better or worse than that person. And just because that's our first inclination doesn't make that right because God made all of us to be equal. We're equally loved in his eyes. We're equally able to have a relationship with him, and we're all equally important to God. In the second half of the passage that Emily read for us, Paul describes this new temple that is being built, and every Christian is a part of the new temple. Jesus in this temple is the cornerstone, the load-bearing stone, the most important part, the first part. And then the rest of the foundation is the apostles and prophets. And then each Christian is continually being added to this structure as it gets built up. 
So basically, we're all these individual bricks in God's new temple. And that means that we all have individual roles in his new temple, and we're all a part of his family. Now, I'm not saying we're all exactly the same, like all bricks are the same, because we're not. God has given us different personalities and different talents, and he's even made us look different. We're unique, and we each have our own place where we fit in this temple. We each have different ways that we serve and impact other people. Some of us are gifted musically, so we lead worship. Some of us are gifted athletically, and so we play sports for the glory of God. And some of us love kids, so we teach Sunday school, maybe. You see, we all have the place God has for us to further his kingdom. But even though we all have different places, we still have that same importance. And we all have the same access to God. Verse 19 says that through Christ, we all have access in one spirit to the Father. We're all meant to have a relationship with God. And having a relationship with him means that we get to be a part of this wonderful kingdom. And that kingdom is a community. As part of the temple, we have to rub elbows with each other. We have to be in community. Bricks that aren't right next to each other aren't going to make a very sturdy structure. And in a similar way, when we build walls up around us, we aren't making a sturdy kingdom. You see, walls can be impactful and harmful. My sister learned that the hard way. And so my encouragement to you then is to tear down the walls that you see. Don't wait until you smack your face on a wall to change. It's to stop going like this and instead go like this. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, just this wonderful opportunity that we have to go to a Christian school and be a part of your kingdom and your community. I pray that you would uh, help us all today and for the rest of the year to uh, find the places in our lives where we can be closer to other Christians and be closer to people that maybe we wouldn't have wanted to interact with in the first place. I thank you so much for your love and for your salvation and for the blessing of heaven that we can hope for. In your name, amen.